thank you all for coming. Um, just make sure to mute yourself. Once all the speakers have finished, um, we'll make sure that we have time to mingle and everybody can talk amongst themselves. I will leave the Zoom up as well so the people on Zoom can also interact and you guys can come up to whatever screen you want and talk to them. Um, but there will also be um, some refreshments afterwards. Sorry for those on, for you on Zoom, you will not be able to partake. <laughs> um, but uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the JCC COO, uh, Mark Horowitz. Thank you. I'm just going to take one minute. There are so many people speaking today. I did know Howard for decades, and I knew Howard in many, many different ways, not the least of which is sitting in our lobby almost every day, um, just looking and watching. And I always passed by Howard and wondered what he was thinking, because as you know, he may have been thinking all kinds of things that he sometimes said, actually often said, um, whether he should have or not, or didn't say. And um, when I first came here, uh, just a couple of years ago now, uh, again, after having been here um, a long time ago, um, I was the chief people officer. And uh, Howard called me over and he said, so uh, you're back, what are you doing now and what are you? So I gave him my title, he said, chief people officer. He said, well, I'll have to remember that. And every day after that, which was many days, he would call me over the way Howard does. And you never don't come when Howard calls you over. You went to the table and he would sit there and he would look at me and he'd say, how are your people? <laughs> and I'd say, my people are fine. He says, good, I'm going to check with you to make sure your people are OK. Um, I just wanted to be up here tonight to declare that I was very proud to be one of Howard's people. Um, it was a real gift and a real honor. And because Howard was on the um, committee for the Jewish Repertory Theater, I know he would want me to remind you that we are in the middle of a very important play called Kinder Transport. And Kinder Transport um, is a remarkable play written about the young children who were sent from Germany mostly to England but it's a family drama. I have already seen it once and signed up for two more times. It's one of the most remarkable performances I have ever seen. I've seen over 300 plays on Broadway. All my playbills are in my office. You can come and check. And I promise you, you will never see anything better than what you're going to see here. We're almost getting full in many of the performances. So please think about coming. It's, we don't need you to be here. We want you to be here. And, uh, I will next introduce Alexis, Howard's daughter, who is on the screen. So let me just say to you, we have prepared all day to make sure this works and it's technology, so who knows? So we're gonna do our best and make sure you see that. So you will hear most of the people um, on our screen. Manju, hi, hi, hi. Um, okay, well, um, thank you, Erica and Mark. Um, and hello to all my father's wonderful friends and family. Uh, thank you for making it here this evening. Um, I'm joining you from here, here from Israel and filled with gratitude and love to be joining this tribute. Um, I had wanted to read a poem of my father's, um, but I thought that I would say something instead uh, about growing up with a writer. Um, the poem I wanted to read was called Flight. Um, and as most of, most of you know, I definitely took a lot of flights in my life. Um, it's about me, the poem, about us in the moment as father and daughter um, and his wishes, even when I was a baby, that I would remember those cherished moments with him in the future. Um, and in lucky fact, we had 58 years of blessed time together ahead of us. Um, I remember our times together every day, and today is a very special day to remember him for this tribute to the JCC, the Jewish Community Center of Greater Buffalo, our second home. And I'm honored that the JCC is bestowing this time for dad. While I grew up in an extremely rich, and privileged in cultural environment. The heart of my dad's cultural world was his life as a writer at home, 123 Cornell Avenue in Amherst. Every morning I would awake to the smell of fresh brewed coffee, classical music playing, 
softly as I heard my father tapping on the keyboard writing. He was dedicated to words. Dad was the warmest person that I knew. He always made time for friends and conversation. He would stop in the middle of the road um, or in the market just to chat. It was his dedication to words within and words shared. I'm deeply thankful for the beautiful life he gave me. Dad, Dad, in summers ahead, I will remember a father who flew me to the ocean and carried me away safely in his arms. Thank you for giving me such a beautiful life. One of, one of Dad's best friends, Carl, is here to speak this evening. I proudly introduce Pulitzer Prize winning poet, Carl Dennis. Yes. Is oh, no, 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 could you please make the volume lower? Thank you, Alexis. Um, Alexis mentions that Howard gave some of his best hours every day to his writing, and I wanted to commemorate that just by reading two small selections from uh, two different essays. There's no volume here. This is just for, I'll try to speak more loudly. Um, so the first uh, is a section of a letter that um, Howard wrote in 19, 94, when he was teaching at Hong Kong. It happened to be the date of the 40th uh, anniv anniversary of his graduation from his high school, Horace Mann. And he wanted to be there, of course, but he couldn't be there. He was teaching in Hong Kong. And he um, instead wrote a letter to whoever was organizing the event um, in New York City. And it took the form of an essay, which ostensibly is in part about his relationship to um, uh, <laughs> the uh, J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye, but really isn't because that's a novel about alienation. And what's interesting about this letter is he reminiscences, reminiscence about his um, time at Horace Mann is how unalienated he was, how totally committed he was to uh, the educational experience. Alexis mentions that um, he was a bookish man, and it's true, but he grew up in a, in a environment without books. And going to Horace Mann was a kind of revelation to him that there was a world that he hadn't imagined. Anyway, um, so let me read a, just a couple of pages from this letter, it's kind of an intimate form of the more impersonal essays he wrote about um, defining cultural moments. <clears throat> I regret that I can't be with you on this special occasion of our 40th reunion. As a mere schoolmaster, not a jet setter, I can't afford to fly from Hong Kong to New York City for a few days until my contract ends here in June. I can only afford to send a few commemorative words, my speed post. Um, and he, then he asks the question, how is today's American world different from the one we knew at mid-century during our years at Horace Mann. He graduated in, way back in 1954 during our years at Horace Mann School for Boys. What assumptions did we make about the world we were about to enter? Would they still be useful for our grandchildren? Or would they only bear a generational imprint? Or have we taken our place with other sepia photographs in the family album of American life? We were graduated from Horace Mann in a boom period. If it wasn't quite the golden boom of the 1920s, it was a period of rapid post-war economic growth and expansion 
and we felt that we were going up with the curve. We were graduating from one of the best high schools in the most important city in the most powerful country in the world. Most of us were about to enter citadels of learning and prestige that would launch us into the friendly skies of American dominance. We had air power. We had to keep an eye on the Soviets, of course, but they can constituted only a military threat in the part of the world we cared about, the Western Hemisphere. They represented no economic or cultural challenge. Our products, material and symbolic, were the ones the world wanted to buy. John's, Wayne's, Western's, and Westinghouse products were ones everyone wanted after the liberation of Europe. As people crawled or were carried out of the ash and rubble of post-war Europe, they looked to America for leadership, economic help, and cultural stimulation, hope, energy, optimism, imagination, technical wizardry. They looked to America for patterns of individual life. After a period of catastrophic mass movements, after periods where individuals were annihilated in the names of monolithic abstractions, totalitarian slogans, and genetic myths, to Europeans of this generation, the cowboy, easy in the saddle against the wide sky, or just a jury of ordinary men, these were wonderfully fresh and salvational images. The American Express office in Paris in the mid 50s, when I first went to Europe, was still a venue as glamorous to Parisians as the Biltmore had been to earlier generations of Americans. It was where they could observe a new style. And I remember meeting a former resistance fighter in Brittany in 1969, who told me that Henry Fonda's role in 12 Angry Men had helped him believe in justice again after the horrors of war and the terror of occupation, after the knowledge of the Holocaust. America was in the saddle or the driver's seat and the size and design of our cars in the 1950s expressed our confidence as a nation. We were flashly, bold, innovative. We might find some charm in those little deux chevaux that we saw in French movies, the ones we could see at the Thalia, the Waverly, and a few of the new East Side art movie theaters. Well, we wanted power when we got on the highway. One of our classmates, an Ivy League man, we were all men in those days, always preferred driving a Cadillac to a foreign import. Sometimes during college vacations, we would drive up the West Side Drive and then the Hudson River Parkway late at night and talk about the future. We had no doubt as the air became fresher and the trees greener in the center line and, and the center line whiter as we headed towards Connecticut, that America was a place where we wanted to live and work, that America contained all the resources that we needed to live productive and even creative lives. Of course, we looked to Europe for an added measure of culture. We looked forward to a summer in Europe, a junior year abroad, a grand tour of some kind, even a year or two of postgraduate study in one of the ancient universities. But we thought of Europe as the veneer that needed to be applied to the good, hard American wood. We might admire the expatriation of Henry James, Santayana, Eliot, but we thought of them as belonging to a vanished era. And we had seen what Europe had done to Ezra Pound or what he had been able to do in Europe. We could understand the expatriation of Richard Wright and James Baldwin. We might even feel guilty about the necessity for their expatriation. We were nothing if not liberal minded, but if America belonged to us or soon would belong to us, the grandchildren mainly of immigrants whose time had come. History American style was on our side. Besides, even the cultural scale was beginning to tip towards America. Jazz had come into its own as a world-class art form. Action painting was making New York, not Paris, the International Art Center. And the exile emigration of the fascist era of so many leading European intellectuals to America, composers, filmmakers, art historians, sociologists, psychoanalysts made America, particularly New York, more European in the best sense than Europe itself, at least for a while. I'm going to stop there. But you see, he's creating this, this the little letter he's writing to apologize for not being there. 
has led him to grab a teaching moment and run with it and, and do his best to help place his fellow classmates in the context of modern culture. Um, so, and of course, there's a kind of modesty about it too. He's doing all this work. You can deliver it, so it's got to go in some packet that a graduate might get if he comes to New York City, but who knows if they're going to read it. It's just something you do, how it fell, to celebrate an occasion that's worth celebrating. The other piece is uh, even more ephemeral than a letter like this. It's one of the 50 or so um, radio programs that Howard met, read on WBFO uh, back in, when was it? Um, I think 1996 or so. Um, and they're small, slight pieces, but they have occasionally a wonderful grace and poignance about them. And you want to see them written down. They never were. And you knew it. They were just cast into the wind, hoping at the other, someone at the, was listening to the radio at that particular moment on that particular day uh, would hear what he was doing. So here it is. It's a short little piece. Oh, they, I forgot to send. They were all written as if by a man named Howard, by uh, uh, Horace M. Twitchell. And you get that the name gives you a sense of a kind of small town, straight laced fellow who's driving in the slow lane of life. But it's, um, as I say, some of them lift you out of the ordinary world. Okay, this is his piece. This is Horace M. Twitchell reporting from Twitter House with a word of encouragement, if not great hope, for those who think that the parade has passed them by or who even are beginning to wonder if there will be a parade at all. The 19th century novelist Henry James thought the phrase summer afternoon was one of the most pleasant sounds in the English language. I have no quarrel with him, but I wonder if summer's end doesn't have an equal, though somewhat different beauty. Summer afternoon suggests stretching out an endless and languorous moment when picnics seem to last forever and the light lingers patiently in the West until all the baseball games in America have been wrapped up, when the twilight itself is infused with lights so that those same games played in green ballparks all across the land can go, if need be, into extra innings. Summer afternoon suggests endless lightness, an early evening bright enough so that every camper can put his marshmallow evenly on the end of a stick without a flashlight, and tents can be easily hoisted by those who have arrived late at the campgrounds. Summer's end is sad. There's no doubt about it. It sounds like a lone flute in the distance and calls up an image of the solitary reaper. We think of a boy water skiing at dusk when the air is already nippy, when he risks catching cold or of young lovers who have met at summer camp, both counselors for the first time, hugging and sobbing at the edge of a lake, promising each other they will come back next year. Summer's End is a middle-aged English professor who has to teach all summer so he can afford to send his kid to college and he's done some moonlighting playing trumpet on a riverboat so he can squeeze in at the end a walking tour, however brief, of the Inner Hebrides and the Lake Country. He wants to see Keats's waterfall at Ambleside scintillate in the sun while there still is sun. He doesn't believe we'll ever come to nuclear war winter, but it does enter his mind sometimes. Summer's afternoon is the Garden of Eden. Summer's end is the moment before the expulsion. You can't beat one for happiness, the other for drama. As for beauty, it's too close to call. So a lovely piece. Um, I read it at, at his, um, uh, his funeral, uh, 
but I was very glad to read it again. It, it grows on you. Uh, now I want to introduce Gail Wilski uh, coming to us on Zoom, who was for many years a teach, teacher in the uh, uh, biochemistry department here at UB and was a dear friend of Howard's. Hey, uh, thank you, Carl. Is this working? Yes. Okay. Uh, knowing Howard enriched my life and I miss him dearly. He was a good, loyal, caring, compassionate, witty punster and a joy to talk to about anything. His curiosity was boundless. I'm also blessed. Hi, to have, hi Maya. Hi, Maya. Hi, to have come to know Alexis and her family, to whom I send my sincere condolences for their loss. So I need to include this anecdote because I met Howard at the JCC in the cafe when it was run by Karen. Howie would stop for a meal after working out and I would do the same after a swim. We started chatting and realized we were both UB faculty from widely different areas. Howie asked me where I was from and I said Elizabeth, New Jersey. He had actually been to Elizabeth as one of his closest friends from Amherst, Roger Porter, who will be talking, was from Elizabeth. Later, Howie called us the Elizabethans. Roger wanted to know if that made him Shakespeare and me Queen Elizabeth. Anyway, I thought our conversation at the JCC was going well when he asked me for my academic pedigree. Now, this totally turned me off. And I replied coldly, MIT, Tufts, and Harvard. He looked at me quizzically and asked if I had ever considered they're going somewhere with a good reputation. <laughs> I left, and so our friendship started. Alexis calls me the sister Howie never had. Howie was interested in everyone. If we were out to dinner, he would found out the history of our server with great diligence and constantly scan the room for people he knew. I liked to eat at his place or mine. The food was very simple at Howie's. Pappy's potatoes or corn and seaven and steak or a stove pot chicken dish. Salads were not his thing, but he knew I liked vegetables. I could not convince him that when steaming something like cauliflower, the best way was to put the whole head in his makeshift steamer, cut it in half and dump half on my plate. It was fun to find out things about him from what about writings. Um, both of our families were involved in the uh, garment trade in Manhattan. His, his owners, while I am the daughter of a pattern maker. As good New York City Jews, our families retired to the Atlantic coast of South Florida, Fort La Lauderdale and Deerfield Beach, respectively. Now, uh, in one of Howard's more fanciful plays, what's set in a cemetery called Star of David. Now, how many Star of David cemeteries could there be in that area? It turned out that our parents were buried in the same cemetery. One time our visits to South Florida coincided and we went to visit the graves together. I wondered if our moms were playing Mahjong in the Star of David clubhouse. Now, as you know, Howard was passionate about his writing. His illness was short, three weeks from diagnosis to passing. When visiting him in the RPI, in Roswell Park's intensive care unit, before it was clear that medicine could do nothing for him, he was asking me to check on things. He wanted me to contact Elizabeth Licata, his editor for the current Buffalo News My View columns, to which he contributed many. Since he wrote so many columns, one would never know exactly when they would appear. I'm sad when I read the paper and know that one of Howie's columns will no longer be there to surprise me. His other request was to contact Chris Helvey, the editor of a magazine trajectory, and if you can see, I have a copy of the magazine here, uh, to which Howard contributed many articles. He was thinking that a memorial issue with some of his articles and Chris writing an introduction would be nice. Chris told me that Howie had two articles in the press, one in the 25th entry, uh, issue for fall 2023 and one for the spring issue. Chris dedicated the November issue to Howard and included his essay on being a UB English department faculty. Chris added information behind the typical author's bios about Howard's career. 
I would like to close by reading the dedication Chris wrote for the issue. This issue was dedicated to Howard R. Wolf. Howard left this dimension in October, 2023. He was an honorary literary professor, a determined proponent of the literary arts, a fine writer of both fiction and nonfiction, and an admirable human being. He will be missed by many. And I have copies of that magazine for those who were there. And Alexis, when I get the spring one, I'll send it to the I'll send them both to you. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Darwan, an English professor at Delhi University, who worked uh, many things with Howie. <clears throat> My dear friends okay. in India and overseas. Today, I feel honored and blessed to pay homage to my dear friend, Professor Howard Wolf, who was indeed a friend, philosopher, and a guide of mine. My friendship with Howard stood the test of time. I came in contact with him as early as in 1990, when he visited India to, to attend the All India English Teachers Conference held at SK University. Anandpur. Since then, we were in constant touch with each other. Professor Wolf was a very, was a manifested personality. He was a brilliant scholar and an eloquent speaker. For him, teaching was not just a profession. He wanted to share knowledge with all others and liked to interact with them on various issues. This is evident from the fact that he lectured in as many as 20 countries in the world. He was a wonderful host. A few years ago, my wife, Dr. Ushan, and I visited the U.S. and stayed with him for a week at his residence. Day in and day out, we discussed everything under the sun. He took us around the town and also introduced as to his friends, including Professor Arthur, Arthur Efron. Subsequently, he introduced me to Dr. Elan Mandilo, who received an education from the State University of New York at Buffalo and now works in Florida. As I said, a friendship blossomed from the academic to the personal. His grandson, Tyler, son of Alexis, while on his visit to India, stayed with us at our residence for a week in New Delhi. Like his grandfather, he is genial and heartwarming person. Howard was indeed a great person who touched so many hearts and so many lives. Though he visited India only once, he grew fond of India and Indian scholars. Many of them were in touch with him and enjoyed his intellectual friendship. Howard was a profile author. He was a prolific author. He published many books on scholarly subjects. Later on, later in life, he did creative writing as well. I, as chief executive of Prestige Books, published th three of his books. A drama, uh, which is, if you can see, home at the end of the day. Another, yeah. Another is uh, this is short stories, second time around. This one is the second book I published, and third is very lately, a few, a couple of months ago, I published his third book. It's a novel, Distant Love. So these are the three books I, and uh, he was working on the fourth book, uh, which was to be published by me. How, uh, after that, uh, I'm part of, I'm especially grateful to Howard for introducing me to Elaine Mandelo. She got her book published by our publishing house, Prestige Books, New Delhi. The title of the book is... Uh, I'll show you the title. Narrating 
narrating diaspora, a study of five contemporary Jewish autobiographies. The book is a landmark in the history of Jewish studies. It discusses the theme of diaspora with special reference to Jewish diaspora, covering the exile experiences of Jews during the last 4,000 years. The book has 300 pages and wears an elegant look. The cover page shows, uh, as I said, front and back also. Uh, that is the back side of the book. It, the cover shows the Western Wall, Jerusalem. Today, Howard is no more with us, but we are here to celebrate the life of a man who had all the embodiments of a complete man. While I come to conclude now, while Howard was in India, he visited a shrine, an ashram of Indian Saint Satya Sai Baba in Andhra Pradesh. Satya Sai Baba was a, is no more now, but he was very well, a well known uh, saint. People went to him from all over the world to seek his blessings. He was greatly influenced by the teachings of Sai Baba, especially by his passionate advocacy for all sided, full fleshed life. Because Howard believed in, you know, not wasting time. He was always doing either traveling or writing or doing lectures. So he was greatly impressed by what Satya Sai Baba said in his uh, poem, is a lyric, and I'll quote, Life is a song. San Satya Baba said, Life is a song, sing it. Life is a game, play it. Life is a challenge, meet it. Life is a dream, realize it. Life is a sacrifice, offer it. Life is love, enjoy it. If we apply this paradigm of Sai Baba to the life of uh, Howard Wolf, we find that he played all the roles that life offers to us. Finally, I join all of you in paying our heart, heartfelt tribute to Dr. Dr. Howard Wolf, the great man from Buffalo. Thank you. Over to uh, over to Professor Manju Jatika. Hello, everyone. I should say good morning to those in India and good evening to those in other places or whatever time you belong to. I first met Howard sometime in 1989, and we have been in constant touch since then. It so happened that I have visited Twitter House. He called his house Twitter House in Buffalo several times because there was a time when almost every year I was visiting the US on some assignment or the other, and Buffalo was always on my itinerary. So Twitter House, I have fond memories of Twitter House. And with Harvard, I have visited JCC also. I, yes, and I quite remember the atmosphere at JCC and how Howie was very much at home out there. When he would get off his car, a, a horde of children, very young children would come and surround him and say, Howard, you know, this is what happened this week. Howard, I went there. Howard, you know, my granny fell down and she's broken her leg. And he was like, like Gulliver in the land of Lilliputians, all of them surrounding him. And he would bend down and talk to him with so much care, so much love. So JCC was a home to him. And it was very much part of his itinerary, his routine, his daily routine. Uh, I really cherish my visits to JCC, although I did not meet any of you there who are watching now. Uh, I also would like to tell you how devoted he was to Tyler. When I met Tyler in the US, he was just 
I think eight or 10 years old and Howard was looking after him, dropping him off to his uh, school bus in the mornings. And sometimes when he would go on a camp, Howard would pack his tiffin for the day and uh, then send him, see him off, drop him off at the corner. And uh, uh, then when uh, Tyler left to be with his mother, uh, after a few years, I went, I, when I visited Twitter house again, I saw that Tyler's room was kept just the way it was earlier. You know, all his little shorts and shirts, t-shirts and everything folded and kept neatly on those shelves as if any day Tyler would walk in and wear those little clothes all over again. And then a couple of years ago when Tyler visited India, and he stopped in Chandigarh, that is where I was then. I was looking for the same boy, that 10 year old, but no, it was a different Tyler. And he was on a motorbike. He didn't look like the little boy I knew. And he told me, don't tell my grandfather that I am I'm running around in India on a motorbike because he's going to be very upset. So afterwards, when I talked to Tyler, uh, to Howard, he asked, so how was Tyler and how was his, how did he travel? I said, I think it's better if you ask him yourself. So I did not give Tyler away. Hmm. Uh, well, Twitter House, Twitter House, I think was named because of the time, the happy times that Howard and uh, Tyler spent out there. And I, uh, Alexis, you know, the first mention of you um, was uh, in uh, 1988 or 89. And Howard told me, you know, I have a daughter and I'm really concerned about her, the direction she's taking, the choices she's making. He was, and he showed me pictures of both of you, I think in Berlin. You had gone to see Berlin. You had gone to Berlin and against the Great Wall, if I remember correctly, the Wall of Berlin. So he showed me some pictures of um, Alexis too at that point. Uh, then, uh, just as Dr. Dhawan has got his books published, um, Howard got some books published in Chandigarh, which I put him in touch with the publisher out here. And in fact, one of his consignments of a hundred books I carried with me on my, on my visit to the US. He asked me, how will you manage it? I said, that's okay, I travel light. So one extra item will be your books. So I did that. And he was very happy. Two of his books were published in Chandigarh. Uh, I, the last message that I got from Howard was in August, 2023. And he wanted to do a session with, uh, with uh, you know, one I conduct sessions online with writers and uh, intellectual discussions, literary forums and so on. So he wanted to do a session and he says, tell me, I would love to talk about, give me a date. I would love to talk about uh, Trump and Biden and what's happening in America. Uh, I have been organizing literature festivals and in 2022 with Chris Helby, he was in one of our sessions and the session went off very nicely. Uh, in October, 2022, three, no, uh, 2022, sorry. He uh, sent me a message saying, I will be 86 on November 5th. And I always wished him on November 5th. The last time, of course, I was sad, I could not wish him. He says, I will be 86 in November, on November 5. I was a strapping 52 when we met. Time has flown. I know in the words of Henry James Sodoff, I continue to do, that is read, think, write, observe, absorb, write. In my own words, embrace and value the life one has lived. Emily has it right in our town. Most people fail to recognize the depth and beauty of the present moment and all the present moments they have experienced. I'm reading Howard's message. Of course, there is too much in our world that casts a dark shadow over that recognition. America is at a fork in the road. Now listen to this one. America is, a, is at a fork in the road. I wish I could pick up a gardener's fork and jab Trump in the rump. Please quote me. He said, please quote me. 
I'm writing a series of academic satires for humantimes.com. And then he attached a small journalistic commentary in which he talked about paying attention to the past. And he also talked about how one should not be obsessed with one idea because that one idea can lead to a lot of harm, a lot of harm to humanity. And he says, he quotes T.S. Eliot who says, T.S. Eliot who understood perversely the craving for salvation at any price, even if it included his own anti-Semitism and irre irredeemable moral stain on his standing as a great poet, says in Gerontion, signs are taken for wonders. Maga, make America great again, is one such sign. So Howard was not just a creative writer or an academician, he was one, and I hate to speak of him in the past tense, he was one who, who was interested in what was happening. And even so late as August, at my last communication with him was in August last year, he said he would love to be on one of our conversations talking about what is happening in America. Well, I have happy memories of him. Um, he was an excellent host, excellent host, really. As Dr. Dhawan says, he was really a very good host and he would plan out everything. Okay, one day we are going to the nursery to pick up some plants. Another day we are going to the grocery to pick up some grocery stores. And, and then, yes, and he would have something lined up. Uh, yes, he had some friends over on one occasion. It was very nice meeting his friends in Buffalo. So bless you, Howard. Thank you for the happy times. And thank you, Alexis. I got to know you through Howard. And I have, well, I'm so glad that we can connect now. Uh, I will stop at this point, even though I'd love to read a few other things that he had sent to me. He had an excellent sense of humor, really excellent sense of humor. And with, you know, poker-faced humor, that's what I liked about him. He was one of those who was really in intelligent, intellectual, and I think he deserved more recognition than he actually got. Perhaps the University of Buffalo would think of honoring him and you know, creating a memorial or something like that for him, it would be well deserved. So thank you very much. And now over to John Zimmer. John Zimmer, a friend of his. Thank you. Is John Zimmer here? The next one is Roger Porter. Oh, here, here English I am. and Humanities. Here I am. Here I am. Oh, you are here. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Right. I'm John Zinner, and I'm a friend of Howie's from college days, and two other college classmates all close to Howie are here this evening, Roger Porter and David Luria. And my wife, Elizabeth, knew Howard from the college days as well. Uh, Howie was a close friend, but we we didn't get together a whole lot because I'm we're living in Washington, D.C. area, and he's living in Buffalo, but we did keep in touch, and we were meeting monthly with our Amherst buddies on Zoom. I thought I would tell a little anecdote that characterizes the things that you guys have said about Howie, but it's a different context because we've talked about Howie's zany, warm sense of humor and his love of wordplay and his Jewish self-confidence, self-consciousness, um, as well as his self-effacing humor at times. So Amherst is an all-male school, was at that time an all-male school. And to meet women, we had to travel to girls' colleges in the area which we did do. And on one adventure, Howie and I decided to go to a junior college for girls, for women, young women, some distance from Amherst. And we drove there in the evening and we thought we would just meet people spontaneously. But when we got there, we saw that it was a very waspish place. Lots of girls with blonde hair and plaid skirts 
and we didn't know whether we would fit in. And Howie felt self-conscious about being Howard Wolf, and he wondered how would it sound if he was introducing himself to all of these Christian women as Howard Wolf. So he said, I'm going to change my name for tonight, so please remember it. And he changed his name, and he decided instead of Howard Wolf, he was going to introduce himself as Hunt Wolfington. <laughs> which, which he did. But that's how his sense of humor. And I thought I'd tell that little story, which is the first thing I thought about when I heard that he had died. Because it was such a happy, funny memory of him. Now I'm going to pass on to Roger Porter, who is the closest friend of Howard's from Amherst. Hello, all. Uh, can you hear me? Um, I'm assuming that's a yes. Howie and I were uh, college roommates at Amherst, as John said. We go back really 68 years or so. So we've had an enormously long friendship. And uh, we emailed three, four times a week. So we were just constantly in touch. And over the years, I think we exchanged something like 500 letters each before email. So it's it was a very long and, and very uh, deep friendship. We talked about everything, teaching, travel, therapy, books, relationships, family, politics. There was nothing that was out of bounds. Uh, we met at a number of places around the country and around the world. Um, but for the most part, uh, I came to Buffalo and probably 20 times over the years. And of course, we went to the JCC together a lot. And one of my one of my memories about going to the JCC was that it was always at least 45 minutes before you walked through the doors and you got into the, the gym itself. Howie was schmoozing with everybody. Uh, he was called by his friends, the mayor of Buffalo. Well, he was the commissioner of the JCC. And he just felt uh, that he needed to talk with everyone to find out generously who they were, what their families were doing, but also to tell them about himself. And of course, he loved to share his writing with people. Um, he also... As someone has said, he also loved the kids there. He was he was he was the man who loved children, uh, but he also spent a lot of time looking for women. He you know he was single for most of his, for almost all of his life, uh, and he loved the idea of prospecting for women. He once told me that he was looking for a Brigitte Bardot, but all he found at the JCC were Yentas. So that was one memory uh, of, of Howie at, at, at the JCC. Um, I want to read a little piece that Howie wrote. It's, it's an email, and it's one of the last emails that Howie ever wrote. Uh, it was written just a few days before he died. And uh, it was written to the Amherst friends who were on Zoom, as John mentioned. Uh, and it's a poignant letter. If you think about this, uh, Howie was quite sick. He didn't know how sick he was. And this is what he said. This is one of two pieces that I want to read. Howie said, our common roots were deep and have held us together. This is a way of saying how much I appreciate the fact of our closeness at a distance at this time of medical distress and how moved I am by your support. I'll be under superb care at Ros Roswell Park so don't overworry about the fate of old Ironsides. My ensigns are tattered, but the bark is still afloat. I may list to port. I am, after all, left-leaning. And I've spread my sails, and I've continued to sail the seven seas. Words and oxygen are now the air I breathe. Let's continue to be Zoom mates. Remember, Zoom golly golly, that old Sebra song. I am, I am completing a monograph called From Experience to Imagination, A Life in Words. So I have plenty to keep me busy, even as I now have a portable oxygen unit. So I'm not housebound or bound in any way. That was a letter written just days before he died. 
And he was very much to the end, Wolf, I think, Wolf Unbound. He died, as most of you know, or many certainly know, on October 7th. Yes, he died on that day, October 7th. And many of us thought that however horrifying it was that he died, that it might have been better for him to die before he realized what had happened with the Hamas attack, the horrific Hamas attacks. Of course, he would have been worried to death about Alexis and about Tyler. He didn't know whether Tyler would uh, have to go back into reserves. Uh, but I, while I mentioned Tyler, I want to say something very funny that how we said about him. You know, he was always very concerned about Tyler. And when Tyler went off to um, to India, he went to a Buddhist retreat. He was searching for a guru. And how he said in this wonderful way, he said, why can't Tyler just be a CPA or a dentist? And there was a, there's a wonderful kind of moment of bourgeois uh, feeling about, about his grandson. I want to read one more other, one more piece. Um, how he traveled extensively. He gave lectures in 20 countries and he loved writing letters from other places. And uh, this is a letter from a book about uh, travel that, that Howie wrote, and it's about India. And I, I didn't know that there would be three uh, people from India on, on the, um, uh, the session tonight. So this is a coincidence that uh, this, is, this is a letter from, this is a piece that Howie wrote in India, I think in 1990. And it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating piece um, it's about preparing, how you prepare. There's a refrain in this. Uh, you are never prepared for what you see in India. And he meant by that, that you can never prepare for experiences that seem so estranged from what you have lived in your whole life. Nothing prepares you for something that is so uh, foreign to you. And yet, the act of immersing yourself in that experience is absolutely fundamental. He says, if you travel by train in India, as you are likely to do as a matter of necessity and economy, you become aware of your body and the bodies of others. In anything less than air con first class, and even there, the toilets are likely to be stuck and stuffed. And so that as you meditate on your bowels most of the time, even as you arrive at a station in the early morning, the image of your arrival, the image of India that you are likely to remember is that of a squatting man, sarong clutched up over his knees, trying to relieve himself safely out of the bush. If you make eye contact with him, he will look at you with that studied indifference that exposed people cultivate in order to deal with embarrassments of public living that poverty and underdevelopment make unavoidable. And when you pull into the railroad station past the bundled and shrouded bodies of waiting passengers, imploring hands will press through the bars of the window. And if you give a few rupees, as you are likely to do if you're American, you will touch the hand of India and you will wonder, despite your compassion and humanitarianism, if you yourself have become untouchable. Even as India makes it difficult to think of oneself as modern, the facts of life in their overwhelming nakedness push you back, make you want to retreat into a safe enclave, some colonial enclosure some Anglo-Indian club where gin and tonic flow freely and where the natives wear uh, Kiplinesque turbans. Even as India uh, makes it difficult, if not impossible, to shrink from facts, to deny actualities, even as India makes one reaffirm the imperative to face the facts of life, so India drives one away forces one to seek shelter against those facts as an act of preservation. Another, nothing prepares one for India. One may have spent decades preparing oneself for a passage from self-consciousness to the transcendent and transpersonal mythologies of India. One may even have practiced something like 
Hindu patience itself in getting ready to meet the incarnations of gods, the reigning deities, whose images are impressed on every concavity and convexity of banyan tree. But on arrival, one is likely to watch and recoil against what one sees that he is likely to participate in the daily rituals of living and dying that mark the city streets. As much as I wanted to go to India since leaving college, as much as I had wanted to open myself to the spiritually cleansing effect of the legendary subcontinent, I now found myself huddled in the back of a sedan, looking at and away from the road, intriguing, intrigued and appalled by the young bathers who poured buckets of water and excrement over themselves as they, as they washed down the water buffalo whose horns gl glided just above the murky water. For all their openness and nakedness, for all the fusion of man and animal, they were not Matisse's or Whitman's bathers, and I did not feel like celebrating them in poetry. But I set out each morning in search of definitive experiences to hear the song of humanity, to see the real, the actual, the human, with map in hand and musty rupees stuffed in my linen pants, I set out in quest of the experience that years of teaching, reading, and writing about American literature had concealed. I think that's a wonderful piece. Um, Howie's honesty about being engaged, about engagement and detachment, about his love of the country and his fear, about India as seduction and even India as re revulsion. But ultimately, he's deeply drawn to India's um, abiding humanity, its essential reality. And I read that piece because, as I say, not because I knew that there would be um, uh, some some folks from India on on this um, uh, in this memorial. But I read it because I think it it cap encapsulates Howie's wonderful sense of plunging himself into experience, no matter what it might reveal. Uh, he wasn't really afraid of anything in that sense, and I think that's one of the great qualities of of him. And he will be missed enormously by by all of us. So. Uh, I next want to introduce. Um, Another um, uh, professor from the University of Delhi, uh, Dr. Suman Bali. Dr. Suman Bala. You're muted, Suman. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, this is Dr. Suman Bala from the Department of English, University of Delhi. I knew Howard as a fellow academic and as a friend for more than three decades and exchanged notes with him on various academic and personal matters. He was an erudite scholar who achieved distinction as a teacher and also as a creative writer. He was a pro prolific writer and published several books. Um, as editor of uh, two journals, the Commonwealth Review and the Indo-American Review, I also published his articles. And he would always ask for my opinion of the uh, subject, whichever, whatever subject he was covering. I also edited his books. So he had great trust in my editorship. Before, before publishing each book, he would send his final draft to me to go through the text and edit it. Any change or modification I suggested was greatly appreciated by him. <clears throat> I used to feel humiliated and flattered by his response, saying things like, you are a perfect editor, nothing can be better, and things like that. That showed his generosity and magnanimity. 
He never felt shy to pay a compliment to anyone if he thought he or she deserved it. During last three years, he had been insisting that I should visit him and stay at his residence for a few days to discuss literature, politics, minorities, and subjects of mutual interest. I was planning to visit him, but somehow it got postponed due to some reason or the other. And before I could finally schedule my program, came the news that he had passed away. The news was sudden and shocking. I had received his email only a fortnight before his death. Anyway, it's my loss not meeting him before he passed away. Today, I feel gratified to pay my homage to my great and dear friend, Howard Wolf. Thank you so much. Um, I know uh, the next speaker is Mr. Koitsi, the Nobel Award winning uh, writer and a friend who always commented on his works. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bala. Um, unfortunately, John couldn't come to the Zoom call in person. However, he did send me um, a short video that he would like to share. Um, let me pull that up here really quick. All right, if everybody on Zoom could um, check out the screen that I'm sharing, I'll give you guys a minute. All right, are we all ready? Okay. Hi, old friend. I miss you. I miss your letters with their wry stories of trying to keep the inner flame burning during these dark times in the life of your nation. I miss too your other self, the self to whom you gave the name Ludwig Fried, the man with the scarlet letter I emblazoned on his chest. Ludwig, who never gave up searching for the supreme love of his life, who kept promising himself that one day he would write a great book, a book that would justify all his suffering here on earth, if only he could get down to it. The stories of Ludwig Fried have at last come to a terminal stop. I miss Ludwig, I miss even more, you their author. Go well, old friend. We don't say when people die, we're sorry to the lungs. We generally try to say in Hebrew or in English, may their memory be blessed. Oh. May their memory be for a blessing. And in Jewish life, we think about people dying at least two times. Certainly their physical bodies are gone, but we concentrate on the moment when their souls are released and the way that we remember people is through their memories and the memories that they bring to each and all of us. It is very clear, if it wasn't before, that Howard will be remembered for a very long time in the hearts and minds of the people on the screen and in this room and beyond, people who will read his work, who will have stories about him from the people who have stories about him. And so there is but no doubt that Howard will be remembered for a blessing, for our blessings, and we bless and hope for him to have rest and peace. I'd like to quickly thank, before I ask Erica to close, um, Erica, who really did a remarkable job in getting all these countries and people and places and technology together so that we could have a seamless way of honoring and blessing Howard.
Thank you so much, Mark. Um, thank you so much for everybody who was able to come tonight um, in person and on Zoom. Uh, for those of you that got up at 5 a.m. to do this and 2 a.m. to do this and any other time of wherever you are in this um, beautiful world, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Um, I would just like to say we're going to have some refreshments. Um, I'm going to leave up the Zoom call. Um, I'm also going to open up the floor for you guys if you wanted to talk a little bit. Um, but yeah, but thank you so much to all our speakers and thank you so much to Alexis. I couldn't have done this without you. Um, you knew everyone to contact um, and it was a really huge help. I couldn't have done it without her. Thank you so much.